right, well, if you are joining us for the first time in our series through Nehemiah, we are in week eight. So if you have your Bibles or something with your Bible on it, go ahead and open those up to Nehemiah chapter eight. And I just want to give you, I'm not going to give you the detailed description of where we've been. If you want to catch up on all that, you can go to our YouTube page. You can go to, um, you can go to our Facebook page. You could also go to our website, osilabaptist.org, and there you'll find all the messages. But where we're at up to this point, the people of Israel had been in exile for years and they have been given the freedom to return to Jerusalem. And what they have begun to do is to rebuild. The, the city had been destroyed uh, during a war and during a battle. And so uh, they lost that one. That's why they were in exile, but now they're being allowed to return. And the temple has been rebuilt and they have gone through a reconstruction process, a massive reconstruction process of rebuilding the walls so that the city would be protected. And now that the walls have been rebuilt, we finished up in seven. Now in chapter eight, there's a hinge in the story of Nehemiah. And there's something that's really important for us. And I hope you'll lean in this morning and just kind of grab, turn their focus now inward, because once you've got the structure built, they now have to begin the rebuilding process of the people. So with your Bibles open, Nehemiah chapter eight is where we're going to be. And before we begin the message this morning, I want to ask all of you a question and I would love for you to entertain it. And here's the question. What makes you stronger? What makes you stronger? Now, I'm not talking about physical strength. I mean, that's an easy answer. You say, well, what makes you stronger? Well, you got to go exercise. Okay, great. Not what I'm talking about. What I want to know is when you think about your inner life, your soul, your mind, all of the things that you have to deal with that are outside of your physical abilities, what is it that makes you stronger internally? What is it that makes you stronger spiritually? What makes you spiritually firm and mentally tough? What is that? What do you go to? What is your go-to that makes you spiritually firm and mentally tough? What gives you the ability to keep going when everybody else wants to quit? What is it? What do you use? What is your internal exercise that helps to give you strength? What makes you stronger? What is it that enables you to joyfully walk through difficulties when everybody else seems to crumble? What gives you the power to walk confidently through every opportunity and through every strain that you deal with. So what makes you stronger? When I ask that question, I'm asking to, yes, set up an answer. But before we get to the answer from today's text, I want you to consider your go-tos. When life's hard, where do you go? When, when things get difficult, when strains come, when you have heartache and you have headache, because you, you lay in your bed at night and you can't turn the switch off because you're dealing with struggles and problems. What is it that you do? What's your go-to when life gets so suffocating that you feel like you just almost can't breathe? What is it that you go to? Now, when I was, um, when I was in elementary school, uh, arcade games were big deals. How many of y'all remember those things? <laughs> Don't need them now because you can just stay at home and download whatever you want right now. That's what the kids do. But there were these things called arcades and they were, they were so amazing. And um, for me, it was like uh, going to just a convenience store. So for you young people, if you think about like Circle K, they would actually have a section in a convenience store where they would have two or three arcade games. And you could go in and usually you had to go get like a, a, a bunch of change. You'd give the lady a dollar, they'd give you four quarters and usually it was about a quarter to play. But when I was in elementary school, there was this game that came out. And man, it took the world by storm. And I know what you're thinking. Like they had games back then? Yes, they did. And they were fun, okay? And we enjoyed them. Walk in the store and you could hear the sounds of the arcades. I mean, it was almost like drawing you in. It was like a tractor beam pulling you towards that corner of the store where the arcade games were. And I would go in and, and I usually it was with my uncle and my uncle, you know, I could... I could uh, usually butter him up pretty good. Be like, hey, Uncle Dan, can we, uh, can we play some video games? And he'd get a couple extra quarters and we'd run back there and we'd play video games. But there was this one game that came out. It was released in 1980. Yes, I'm that old, okay? 1980. And in 1981, by 1981, just a year after the game had been produced and put out into stores, there were 100,000 
arcade games that had been distributed in the United States. And by 1981, the games were played approximately 250 million times a week. Big arcade game. And I don't even know what the statistics are for today's games. I didn't even bother looking it up how many times they get played because it'd be a lot. But here is the game. Uh, it, it got so big in the United States, I remember they made a cartoon that came out on Sunday mornings. By the way, that's, used, that's when we used to watch cartoons, kids. Like on sun, Saturday mornings, like Saturday mornings was like cartoon day. And they actually had good cartoons. I mean, they had Bugs Bunny and all these other things. They were good. But there were, they made a cartoon out of this video game and it, it, was, it was big time. I used to get excited when I was a kid. I'd want to get up and I'd watch it. Um, they even had a breakfast cereal. Like this thing got so big, they made a breakfast cereal uh, out of it. And, and I mean, it was huge. I remember when we used to have the book fair. Do they still have those book fairs? Like, okay, great. Now they do it on Kindle, I guess. You just download it, go in there and pick out what you want to download. Um, we'd go to the book fair and you could buy pencils. And they had this, they had, this video game had pencils that you could buy. And so, of course, when I went into the book fair... Uh, I would buy some pencils with this video game on it. Now, let me tell you about the video game because I know you're kind of trying to figure out what video game is, right? Like many of you were sitting there going, all right, what, what video game is it? No, it wasn't Asteroids, all right? The video game, let me tell you what it's about. This, this video game, was a, it was essentially a maze filled with 240 dots, which you walk, walk, walk around and got, you tried to eat them all, right? And, and then there were these four like villainous ghosts that when the game started, they'd come out of their little box. I don't know if you remember the names of them, Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and there was this one I would have thought would have just kind of keep going with it, call him Stinky, but no, they called him Clyde, okay? So those were the four ghosts. All right, so all together now, what is the video game called? Pac-Man, there you go, Pac-Man. It was a huge, huge, huge game. Now, there was this, uh, the cool thing was, is they would come out and chase you and they'd put this pressure on you. And literally they're trying to destroy you, right? They're trying to kill you three times. If they get you game over, right? And then you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get out another coin and put it in the slot and, and, uh, play another game. But I remember, uh, the, the cool thing about the game it, for, in those of you who have played before you get it, right? Like, so there's on the board, there's 240 dots, but there's four of them. There's four of them that if you get those things, suddenly the ghosts turn from colors to like this like opaque blue or, or transparent blue and they start floating around. And now you're no longer the hunted. You become the what? The hunter. And so it's like, now we can go get them, baby. We can go eat the ghost. And I, I bring all that up to say this to you. When I ask the question, what makes you stronger? Don't you wish sometimes in life there was just one of those power pellets? Like, okay, God, this ain't working this week. I just need something. I need, I need, I need a little something in my life that's going to make me feel stronger that I can go conquer anything. All of those things that are attacking me, all of those things that are coming against me, I just wish I had something that would just give me the power and the ability to overcome and overwhelm anything. And the reality is, is life can often feel a lot like Pac-Man. I mean, we're, we're busy, right? Trying to clear all the dots. We're trying to get all of our things off of our to-do list. We're constantly working. We're constantly trying. And while we're trying to do all of these things, guess what? We, we have these things coming at us. And sometimes it's in the, in the you know, version of people. People come against us sometimes, make life hard for us. Sometimes it's our own thought processes that we struggle and wrestle with, whether or not we're going to be able to handle all of the things that are coming our way. And so life sometimes just feels like Pac-Man and I just need a power up every now and then. So let me ask you a question. What makes you stronger? Well, in Nehemiah 8, he knew that the city structure, the walls that had been built, they're strong. We've, we've built the walls. We've got the city kind of enclosed. The gates are repaired. They're fixed. But in order to have a strong city that's going to be able to withstand the attacks of, of enemies... Nehemiah knew something else. He knew there was something that was more important than the strength of its walls. He knew that the people had to be strengthened. So with the completion of the walls, it's now time to turn their attention into the rebuilding of the people and how this is accomplished might give us some insight into how we can strengthen ourselves to prepare ourselves for all of the things that are going to come our way. I mean, if we listen, every one of us in here have probably had one of those weeks where we just didn't know if we were going to make it. We're just hoping to see the end of the week. 
God, help me get through this situation. Help me get through this conversation. Help me get through this week of work or whatever all of your dots may be. And we're just thinking, God, I just need to power up. How are we going to get through this? So Nehemiah chapter one, verses, uh, or chapter eight, verses one through eight. What I hope that we will see is that some, there's some things that happens in this chapter that can give us some insight on how to strengthen ourselves and how to strengthen our church and how to strengthen those in our community. Okay, so here we go. One through eight. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Now just real quick, not all of the Old Testament or even New Testament for that matter, it doesn't happen in the chronological order in which it's laid out. So at the time of the writing of Nehemiah, Ezra is also doing ministry. So the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah kind of overlap one another. So you see right here, Ezra gets invited into this process. So they say, they tell Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Verse two, so, the, so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. Now, I highlighted that word, understand. And we're going to get to that in just a second, but you're going to see it not once, but several times in this chapter. Verse three, and he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could what? Understand. There's the word again, understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood uh, Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, or, or Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Pediah, Mishael, uh, Melchijah, Heshum, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all people answered him, amen, amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Benai, Sherebiah, Jemim, uh, Shebathai, Hodiah, Messiah, uh, Kil- Kilida, um, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the, or the Levites helped the people to, here's the word again, understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read the book, they let, read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that people, what's the word? Understood the reading. Now, I would like for us to notice just a few things from this section. Number one, uh, I, I want to I flip back here. It says that um, he read in verse 3, he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. I just want to make this clear, okay? He preached for six hours. Be joyful today. I'm not going to preach that long, okay? All right? But I just wanted to make it known that there were people who do preach longer than I do. All right, second thing that I think is important for us to notice is the teaching of the word was seen as an act of worship. Like the reading of the word and the teaching of the word is not something that we just do academically. How you sit and how you receive, if if I'm not up here, if I'm down there, how I sit and listen and receive the word of God is an act of worship. Like they were raising their hands. They were praising the Lord. They were saying amen. So I would love for us to take a, just a little note out of the book of Nehemiah that preaching of the word would not just be a spectator sport, but it would be a team activity. Amen? That's, you're getting better. All right, this is, we're, we're warming up. The third thing that I think is important to notice is that the word of God became the catalyst for the revival. The word of God was the very thing. He said, all right, so now the walls are built. How are we going to strengthen the people? And what he did is he said, all right, Ezra, come on, let's go. Ezra brings out the law of God. The people stood as they received it. It's the word of God that has the capacity to strengthen people. Nothing else. I don't care what self-help book you go find. It is not going to help you navigate life and strengthen you for what you have to face any more than the word of God. As a matter of fact, not as much and ever won't even come close 
You and I have to be under the word of God. So what makes you stronger? What makes you stronger? Verse nine, Nehemiah 8, 9. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord, your God, do not mourn or weep for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. So a couple of weeks ago, my uh, nine-year-old comes to me and he's like, dad, and he had, has this little toy in his hand. He's like, dad, this thing's broke. And he said, can you fix it? I said, man, let me have that thing. I'll give it a shot. And so he hands it to me and you know, I do what dads do. We fix it. I mean, sometimes we fix it with duct tape, but we fix it. And so he hands it to me and I fix it. And then I hand it back to him and say, here you go, buddy. All good. And he said, thanks, dad. And he walked away joyfully playing with his toy. Now, why do I tell you that seemingly random story? It's for this reason, because I need you to hear this, okay? For in, in my relationship to Asher and him bringing me the toy to fix, I cannot repair what I do not know is broken. Thank you. I, I'm, come on, Miss Teresa, you'll be my pep. You'll be my pep section this morning. I cannot repair what I don't know is broken. I will not attempt to repair of what I am not aware. I will not even attempt it. If I don't know there's something wrong, then I'm not even going to try and fix it. Okay? And so because he brought it to me, I was made aware of the problem. And now because I'm aware, I can repair. This is probably not great grammar. So English teachers in the house, close your ears. There is no fixing where there is no conviction. Okay? I want to quickly give you Three things that I think contribute in the church to what I call unawareness, okay? I can't repair what I'm not aware. And the problem, the problem is in the church, we, we are very unaware. There's a, there's a real big kind of key word in, in, um, in job industries today, right? Like uh, people want their employees to be self-aware. Self-awareness is big. I think self-awareness is huge, Okay. But let me give you three things that I believe, according to Scripture, are areas where Christians are extremely unaware. Number one, if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, one, one of the causes of unawareness is little or no exposure to Scripture. Now, you would think that that would not be true in the church, but I'm telling you, according to statistics, the church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America today is highly biblically illiterate. And it's because we're not reading it. What we're doing is we're going, hey, listen, we're going to go to church on Sunday and somebody's going to stand up on a stage and they're going to give us what we need. They're going to spoon feed us. Earlier, as a matter of fact, Reed Miller and I were having a conversation that when, and, and you know, I'd say this a lot because it's, it, well, because it's true, okay? It, it, when babies are born, they can't do anything for themselves. You got you to gotta feed them. Like when they're baby, 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 they can only eat certain things. You got to give them milk and then they grow up a little bit and you can get, um, you can get cereal for them that helps that milk stay on their stomach a little longer. So you can get a little bit more sleep and then it's on to the Gerber and then it's, and then it's on to bigger foods. But eventually what happens is these, these children, as they age and they mature, you, you remember the drill, right? One day you're, you're feeding little Johnny. And little Johnny's just as happy as he can be, and he's just spitting food out everywhere, and it's getting on the bib, but it's all fun, and it's good. But then one day, little Johnny says, no, 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 I want the spoon. You remember that? Like for you. Now, they're going to make a mess with it, but they want to be, they want to feed themselves. It's part of growing up. You know, you ought to be able to feed yourself. Well, then, then there's this thing that happens. Then one day, they don't, they can not only just feed what you prepare for them, they can actually start preparing their own food. And then one day they get to where they can prepare food for other people and feed other people. And then one day, Lord willing, they have their own little kids and they're feeding them. It's part of the maturity process. And it's a beautiful picture of what we should be as Christians. You know, when I first became a Christian, I didn't know how to feed myself. Like, where am I supposed to go in the Bible to find what I'm trying to do? 
How do, I, I can read the words, but I don't understand the words. I need somebody to teach me. Then one day we get to a place where it's like, oh, now I can read the Bible on my own and it's still kind of confusing, but I, I can make sense of some of the things. And then we get to a place where one day, hopefully we're able to do what Jesus called us to do, make disciples. That means teaching them to observe all that he commanded. And so then we become teachers. It's part of that maturation process. And so one of the causes of unawareness in the church is the fact that we have little to no exposure of the word. Why is that important? Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? The law is sin by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, he says this, I would have not known sin. I would not have known sin. I needed to know the law in order to know what sin really was, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. Now, if you jump down to verse 10 in Romans 7, he said, did that which is good then, meaning the law, bring death to me? By no means it was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin. Man, we love to just like put makeup on sin and go, oh, well, I'm just human. Well, we get that. Like we all know that you're just human. Well, I'm just a sinner like everybody else. Yes, you are, but it doesn't give you a, an excuse to sin. The purpose of this thing and being exposed to it is so that we can know what sin is, so that we can become more aware of our own sinfulness, as Paul talked about in Romans 7. So the second cause, I believe, in, of um, unawareness in the church is this. If you're taking notes, please write this down. Uh, we use the word as binoculars instead of a mirror. Do you know what you do with binoculars, right? You've used a pair have you ever gotten a Panera? Have you, have you ever said, babe, have you seen my binoculars? No, why? Well, I just wanted to get a better look at myself. What do you do with binoculars? We, we put them around our neck. Some, some people like to go bird watching with them, right? You get your binoculars, but you could see things from far off. It gives you a good, uh, you, know where, you know where we see binoculars a lot of times? In football games. People take them to football games so they can sit high up in the stands, but they can still see stuff going on on the field. And so what are binoculars for? Binoculars are for looking at other people. That's what they're for. And we like to use the word of God as binoculars, but what the Bible says, what James would say, and I'll read that to you here in a second, but what James would say is the Bible is a mirror. And so one of the, one of the, the second cause of unawareness is using the word of God as binoculars instead of mirror. Listen to James. James 1, 22 through 26. But be doers of the word, that's important, and not hearers only deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he's like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless." He just said, if you look into the law and you see what it says and you walk away and forget what you're like, but then begin to point out the things about other people. I mean, listen, if you can't bridle your tongue, what do we usually use our tongue to do? We use it to praise God, but we also, James would say, we also use it to curse other people. So when we begin to use the word of God as binoculars instead of a mirror, that is biblical Christian unawareness. Instead, what we should be doing, um, I mean, we so desperately sometimes want our problems to be smaller than other people's problems that instead of fixing our problems, we point out other people's problems to make us feel better about our problems, and you still got problems. Can I testify to something real quick? I believe that the Bible, I believe that if we do what the Bible teaches, our lives will be better. I mean, I really do. I just believe that if we do this, life is better. Now, do not hear what I did not say. I did not say lives would be better if other people did what the Bible said. That's what we're good at. That's what I'm good at. Man, like if I got problems, it's really easy for me to say, well, if that person over there was just doing that, if they were doing what the Bible says, their life would be better. And my life would be too. It's like, well, where can we start? The question becomes, where can I start? Where can I start? Not where can they start because I can't control anybody else. The only thing that I can, can control is the three square feet that I stand in. 
So what am I going to stand on? And the question that I'm going to have to ask myself is really what makes me stronger? You know what makes me stronger? Standing on the word of God, standing on the promises as Clint led us in earlier. So number one, the the first thing that I I think just kind of causes unawareness in the life of a Christian is little to no exposure to the word of God. So evaluate yourself. How much time are you spending in the word of God every week? Um, Number two, using the word of God as binoculars instead of a mirror. And then number three, hearing, but not, what was the word that he kept repeating? Understanding, hearing, but not understanding. Hearing, but not understanding. Hearing, but not understanding. When disciplining our children at home, okay? Little peek into the life of the Stevens family. Listen, if you guys had a camera, you would probably not let me up here, okay? I'm just saying, all right? Like, uh, you know, the Stevens household is not perfect. When we discipline our children, okay? And, and maybe you've done this before. I, I, I'm sure you have because I learned it from somewhere. You've, we probably all learned it from somewhere, probably our parents. But when I'm disciplining our children, if our children do something wrong, I, I, I grab them and I, I correct them. Say, hey, here's what you did. Here's what you did. Is that the right thing to do? Nope. No, sir. It's not. Okay, great. We know that this is not what we do. This is not how we behave. This is not how we talk. This is not. And then I, after, so how... Here's, what, here's how we're supposed to do it. And then I give instruction. And then I say these words. Do you understand? Right? Any of your parents ever say that to you? Do you ever use that on your kids? Or did you ever use that? On, do you understand? Right? So what are, we, what are we saying when we're asking them, do you understand? So what does that word mean? The word understand. Okay? The, the, um, the origin of the word understand does not mean to stand under. When Nehemiah is preaching and proclaiming or Ezra is reading the word of God and it talks about people understanding, it doesn't mean to stand under. To understand literally means to stand in the midst. Okay, now what does that mean? Let me give you, um, let me give you an example from my own life, okay? Uh, we, I've talked about this before. You guys know that in 2019, December of 2019, my house was hit by a tornado. Okay. And you say, I understand. Okay. You saw you, and we see it on TV. We see people's houses who get hit and we go, Oh, well, I understand their house got hit by a tornado. No, no. of understanding what it means to have your house hit by a tornado when your house has been the one hit by the tornado and you're standing in the middle of the debris. You now know that there's a... All right, so get your house getting hit by a tornado doesn't mean that your house just got blown away, but now there's like this whole process. There's... uh, You got insurance companies you got to deal with. You've got builders you got to start dealing with. You got to start having conversations about how you're going to rebuild. Then you've got to relocate. You got to find somewhere else to live. And then you got to deal with a uh, construction project as you're also still dealing with life. And then you're hoping to one day get moved back in, but you also know that things don't just happen the way you want them and they don't happen on the time frame you want them. So there's a deeper level of understanding because we stood in the midst of it. I would imagine people at 9-11, I watched it on TV, but I, I guarantee you people that were there, they stood in the midst of it. They have a deeper understanding of what it means to be hit by a terrorist attack. And so when, he's, when, when we see in scripture where it says, understand, That's what it means to stand in the middle of it and go, I see the destruction. I've experienced the destruction. And I don't ever want to experience this again. So when we look at our children and we go, hey, um, do you understand? Let Let me draw another comparison between children, understanding, and the church. And I heard this. This is not original to me. A guy named Francis Chan used this as an illustration at a, a, a conference I was at probably 15 years ago. But here's, here's what he compared it to. So in, remember when you were a kid, there was a game we played called Simon Says. Y'all played the game? Should we play this morning? It would be fun. Simon Says. Somebody stands up there and they give you instructions. If Simon doesn't say, you don't do it. If Simon Says. I'm, I'm saying this for the kids because I don't think they've made an app for that yet. Okay. All right. So Simon Says. And, and whatever Simon Says is what you do. Like Simon Says, you know, uh, do 10 jumping jacks. You do 10 jumping jacks because Simon said. Now, 
if, if the person who's leading the charge gets up there, obviously, and says, hey, touch your toes, and Simon didn't say it, you touch your toes, you're out. So when Simon says, we do everything that Simon says, but, but when Jesus says, it's, it's somehow optional. Like, here's what the Lord of the kingdom, who is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, he gives commands, and we think it's optional. Now, when, um, so if I tell, if I tell Evan, if, uh, if I say, Evan, um, if I say, Evan, I was upstairs a while ago. Your room is a mess. You need to go clean your room. Evan, Evan doesn't go, ooh, dad, that's good. Amen. <laughs> Woo. Keep preaching, dad. That's good stuff. He doesn't come down from his room an hour later and say, hey, dad, you know, I've spent time thinking about what you said. I've actually memorized it. I can actually say it in Greek now. He doesn't say that. Like, Evan, uh, he, he, um, he doesn't say, hey, Dad. He didn't come down and say, Dad, uh, like, my room's not clean yet, but would you be okay if I had a bunch of friends over? We're going to do a study on what it was you said. It's not, it's not what the goal is, right? Like, the goal is, I say to clean your room, the way you have a good relationship with me is you go clean your room, right? And you accomplish the thing that you've done. But yet, for some reason in the world that we live in, in the church, we hear the words of God and we go, optional. Whatever is convenient, whatever, you know what? Like, I'm just going to do me and I'm, you know, whatever. And that's where the church lives. You will not repair if you're unaware. You will not repair if you're unaware. And Jesus pointedly teaches us, remove the speck from your own eye before you start worrying about the log in someone else's. He's not denying that there is something in somebody else's eye. But what I think he's trying to teach us is you got to fix you. You got to fix you. You got to fix you. The more we worry about other people, the more messed up our life gets. Can I get an amen on that? If not, I was going to amen myself, okay? So question, what makes you stronger? All right, verses 10 through 12. This will be a lot shorter than that last section. Uh, verses 10 through 12, it says, then he said, so the people, remember, they're weeping over their sin. And that's a question for us. Are we broken? As we hear the word of God, as we're exposed to the word of God, does it cause us to be broken about our own sin? So now that they're weeping, he says to them, go away. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for your strength. Man, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Mm. So the Levites calmed all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood, there's that word again, the words that were declared for them. These people heard the word of God proclaimed over them. It broke them so much they began to weep over their own sinfulness. Now, by the way, um, I, I was going to read you a passage of scripture from the original um, William Tyndall translation, which was written in the 1600s, I think, 1700s. I was going to read it for you. Maybe 1800s. I was going to read it for you, and it's so old English that it's really hard to comprehend. How many of you um, have ever, I remember when I first started going to church, um, my wife's dad, who was an independent Baptist pastor, gave me a King James Version Bible. And there's nothing wrong with the King James. I love the King James. But I, I got to be honest with you, as a novice Bible reader, when I first got saved or I first even started going to church, understanding the King James Version was very, very difficult. Okay? Imagine something that even the King James people would have a difficult time reading, and that was the Tyndall translation, okay, in the original way it was written. That was only 300 and some odd years separated from where we are now, almost 400 years from where we are now, right? When the people are receiving this word, it had been a thousand years since they had heard the word of God proclaimed. And so they're broken. 
They're weeping over the reading of the word of God. Number one, because they felt convicted and broken by sin. But number two, just the, the weeping and the joy of being able to hear the word of God proclaimed again. And so the people are weeping because they're broken by their sin and then they go away rejoicing. They go celebrating. That's something I think we could do better as a Baptist church, amen? Like, I think we could celebrate a little bit better um, what God is doing in our midst. And they go celebrating because they understood all that they had been forgiven for. Do you realize how much you've been forgiven for? Maybe the reason that we don't celebrate as much is maybe because we just don't feel like we've been forgiven for a lot. See, the Jews had just observed coming out of this the annual day of atonement. Every, every year they had to go and sacrifice, uh, the, the high priest would come and sacrifice a, a, a lamb and they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat to cover and be, to cover the sins of the people for the duration of a year. The sins of the people symbolically placing them on the goat and then they would send the goat out into the wilderness, and that was called the scapegoat. And so they had just celebrated the Day of Atonement, all of this happening, when their sins would have been paid for. And now they go rejoicing because of their forgiveness. So on the Jewish calendar, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is what they're in, or the tents, the um, Feast of Tents, is right here. It follows the Day of Atonement, and it gives the people an entire week of happy celebration. When we know how much we've been forgiven, when we see the forgiveness of God coming through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it should make us want to celebrate. And the sequence is important. First came conviction, then came cleansing, and then came celebration. Conviction, cleansing, celebration. Conviction, cleansing, celebration. If you can't celebrate, maybe there's something in the middle you need to do. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Convention, cleansing, and then celebration. I got a lot to celebrate, amen? I'm just telling you. I got a lot to celebrate, and it's because he's forgiven me. It's not because I'm good. I just have this so much to be forgiven of because I know how much, done, how much I've done that is wrong in the eyes of God. The word of God brings conviction, and that leads to repentance, but it also brings joy. The same word of God that wounds also heals. It's so beautiful. It's like a good physician. You know, sometimes a good physician's got to cut you to heal you. They're going to hurt you first, but it's going to ultimately heal you and make you stronger down the road. So what makes you stronger? Chapter 8, verses 13 through 18, and we'll close out. On the second day, the heads of the father's houses, uh, men, if you would, just underline heads of the father's houses, of all the people um, with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths. So this is the Feast of Booths during the Feast of the Seventh Month. And that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof. And in, their, and in their courts, and in their courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths from the days, from the days of Yeshua, the son of Nun, to that day the people of Israel had not done so. And there was, uh, and there was a very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rules. So what they're celebrating is the, the reason they would build booths is because when the people of God were in the wilderness, they, would, they, they, they built a tabernacle. They lived in tents, right? Like this is how they... And so it's to remind them of how much God had delivered them from and how God had taken them out of slavery and into the promised land. It's this beautiful picture of their faith journey. Now, the secret of Christian joy is to believe what God says in his word and, okay, and act upon it. That's the secret of Christian joy. It's not just hearing what it says, it's doing it, right? We read that a while ago in James. Faith that isn't based on the word is not faith at all. It's presumption or it's even superstition. Joy that isn't the result of faith is not joy at, uh, at all. 
is just simply temporary happiness. And faith that is based on the word will produce uh, joy that will weather the storms of life. You know, what's interesting is I, I love the song. We've sang it here. Uh, Clint led it, I think, a couple weeks ago. Firm Foundation. I love it because it's really Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, put the song. That the rains came, the winds blew, um, the, the winds blew and beat against the house, right? Like it, the, 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 the rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against the house, but it says it didn't fall. Well, why not? Because it was built on a firm Joy that will weather any storm of life. When you need a power pellet, you'll be able to remember that, you know what? God has, God's word will never, ever, ever fail. Everything else around me, the storms can come, but I'm going to make it through, right? Because why? Because my, my house was built on you is what the song says. I love that verse 13 here in this text says that the heads of the houses gathered around the word. Men, when we begin to gather around the word, when we begin to be the spiritual leaders, when we begin to set the tone in our house, we will see things begin to change in our world. Nehemiah 8.17, if you get when we get down to that, and we'll wrap up here. It says, And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths from the days of Yeshua the son of Nun to that day the people of Israel had not done so, and there was very great rejoicing. I, I do want to just address something here. It's kind of a, it's a Bible thing that I want to deal with. Um, it does not teach that the nation had ignored had ignored the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, since the days of Joshua, because that wasn't. So uh, the feast was celebrated during King Solomon's day in 2 Chronicles chapter 8, verse 13. And also when the Babylonian exiles had returned in Ezra chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, that had happened. However, it was not the fact of the celebration that was so special. Okay, The reason that I think this is getting pointed out, it wasn't the fact that they celebrate, or it wasn't the fact that it was the celebration that was so special. It wasn't the fact of the celebration that was so special, but it was the way they celebrated. All right, so important deal here, okay? It's not the fact that we gather here to worship that's so important. It's the way we worship. If you want, if well, literally, church, if we want to see God do some big things, like if we want to see God really move and stir in our life, like these people, when they sat under the teaching of the word of God and they understood it. They began to rejoice. They were broken at first, but then they rejoiced. Why? Because they knew that they had something to celebrate. Can you imagine? Can you imagine like, all right, we know that I'm a Gator fan. Now, if I, if I invited you, George is off on a Saturday. If I invited you, one of you Georgia fans or a lot of, or all of you, I said, Hey, I got And I told you how loud it was and how great the fans are. If you got there on that Saturday and people in the swamp just sat on their hands and when Florida scored touchdowns, they didn't make I got to take you up to Sanford, right? We, we got to go up there and watch a game. You, we'll show you what fans are like. That's what you would say. Why? Because we expect celebration when victories happen. Thank you. Amen. All right. Like we get in the church, man. It's like you show up to church on Sunday and you're like, I don't know if we want anything. <laughs> it's like, come on, church. We ought to be like th this. We first of all, we should be able to hold the number of people that should be coming to hear about Jesus in this building. Number two, when people show up, when we show up, like every Sunday ought to be a shout fest. Like we should be like, hey man, somebody pass the earplugs because I know it's about to get loud in here, right? Pass the earplugs. And it's not because of the people up here and what's coming out of the speakers. It's because of the people next to us. And it's not even because it's bad. It's just going to be loud. Like, look, man, if the people of Israel march around Jericho and they shout and blast trumpets on that last day and the walls fall, maybe the reason that we're not seeing walls fall in our own life is because we're just not doing enough shouting and praising. So what makes you stronger? 